This video has been a long time coming, but then again, so has Nintendo's upcoming successor to its Switch hybrid console. Today I'm going to be building a picture of the silicon almost certainly at the heart of the new hardware. I'll be talking about its potential capabilities and I'll also be taking the closest equivalent PC hardware available at this point, adjusting its performance to match a potential Switch successor and we'll attempt to get some sort of handle on what the new console can do with a big bunch of Digital Foundry style caveats attached naturally. So where do we begin? The trail first starts when noted Twitter leaker Copite7Kimmy posted this tweet back in June 2021, over two years ago now. He referred to a picture of a Tegra processor from NVIDIA, the T234, and said that Nintendo will be using a custom variant, T239. In the two years that followed, more and more evidence has emerged that suggests that he's right. In November 2016, NVIDIA boss Jensen Huang talked about the firm's partnership with Nintendo, saying he expected it to last two decades. Right now, I can't find any other evidence of a console or any other gaming device where T239 could find a home. To understand this mysterious custom processor, you need to get to know the T234. This is a Tegra chip designed primarily for the automotive industry. Let's be clear here. T234 is a monster of a processor. With a die size of 455 square millimeters, it dwarfs the Series X processor at 360 square millimeters. Fabricated using the same Samsung 8 nanometer technology used for the RTX 30 series GPUs. So it's actually a step behind the 7 nanometer and 6 nanometer processes used in the current generation consoles. The T234 is also available in an NVIDIA Jetson Orin product, which was uh, covered by Austin Evans back in the day, so you can get some idea from his content of how big that chip is. And just generally, I recommend checking out that video anyway. CPU-wise, T234 features 12 ARM A78 AE CPU cores, paired with a GPU based on the 30 series Ampere architecture. 2048 CUDA cores with a 256-bit memory interface. We'll talk more about this later, but T234 requires a lot of machine learning performance, so there's also a deep learning accelerator built in, and its capabilities can be augmented by the tensor cores within the GPU. Expect the T239 gaming chip to be quite different then, it's got to be. At 455 square millimetres, this processor is actually even larger than the 392 square millimetres of the RTX 3070. And with a mixture of common sense reasoning, leaks, Linux updates, a big NVIDIA hack, and inappropriate LinkedIn posts from NVIDIA and ex-NVIDIA staff, we have a very good picture of what form T239 will take. The CPU cluster will be quite different for starters. While the A78 ARM cores are commonplace, the AE variant in T234 is built to meet the stringent standards set by the Automotive Electronics Council, with half the cores used to verify the work of the other half. Totally inappropriate stuff for a games machine. NVIDIA's Linux distribution suggests that T239 has eight CPU cores in a single cluster, strongly suggesting that ARM's A78C will be used instead. Memory bandwidth, crucial for a mobile gaming machine, and it's the primary bottleneck in the current Switch. The 256-bit interface in T234 is wildly extravagant for a games machine, and NVIDIA's Linux update suggests a 128-bit interface instead, almost certainly paired with LPDDR5 memory. We should expect absolute maximum bandwidth of 102 gigabytes per second. But of course, Nintendo can choose to downclock that for improved efficiency. Support for DisplayPort, easily configurable for HDMI, is in T239 as it is in the standard Switch. The difference here is that there's bandwidth enough for full HDMI 2.1 support, assuming that Nintendo wants to deploy the bandwidth in that way. Other spec leaks derived from NVIDIA's Linux distribution are intriguing. There's a full media encode decode block on T239, and although the chip uses 30 series Ampere architecture, the media block seems to be backported from the latest Ada Lovelace chips, 
so it should be faster with support for more formats, including AV1. Improved clock gating, a way of improving efficiency from dormant silicon, is another ADA feature that has somehow found its way into T239. Power consumption, a bit of a hot potato when it comes to discussing this chip, to be honest, as we'll discuss later. Uh, any other interesting tidbits in the Linux distribution? Well, T239 has an optical flow accelerator, a core component of DLSS3 frame generation. The problem here is that it's the last generation Ampere rendition, not the Ada Lovelace rendition that Nvidia deemed good enough to make frame gen happen. There's one more component of T239 worthy of comment, the FDE. It's an entirely new hardware block not found in the original METI T234. FDE stands for File Decompression Engine. Similar to the decompression block found in PlayStation 5, this basically allows for ultra-fast decompression of assets from storage and into memory. There was a recent report from Nate the Hate talking about a Breath of the Wild demo running on Switch 2 hardware uh, with zero loading times. Well, T239 has the hardware to facilitate ultra-fast loading, but obviously it's going to require a much faster storage solution compared to Switch 1 to make that possible. And that's an area where we're kind of lacking details right now. The Linux details paint a very detailed picture of the T239 then, and many of these details were confirmed by an NVIDIA hack. The Ampere GPU architecture, the 128-bit memory bus and LPDDR5 memory, along with the backported power-saving features from the Ada Lovelace design. The hack also suggested that T239 has 1,536 CUDA cores, 75% of the amount seen in the larger T234. So now we have a chip that's a significantly cut-down Tegra with redundant features removed and a file decompression block added. There are a few question marks though. What clock speeds should we expect from CPU and GPU? How fast will the memory run? A question that's key to understanding performance limitations in a mobile processor. There's also the question of whether T239 has the deep learning accelerator from T234 or whether it doesn't. As you'll discover later on in this content, that's gonna be pretty crucial. So we've got a detailed idea of the specs for a chip we know is called T239 that's been in development for several years, was first leaked over two years ago, and has since been referenced several times in Nvidia's Linux distribution, and was mentioned in the Nvidia hack, and in several posts from Nvidia staff on LinkedIn. We also have evidence of an NVN2 graphics API from the hack, clearly a successor to the NVN API used in Switch 1. The hack suggests that several pieces of NVIDIA hardware can be used with NVN2, but there are several sections of the code where it's explicit that it's emulating T239 behavior on that other hardware. And there's our smoking gun. So what should we expect from it? In the recent Microsoft FTC court case, Activision big boss Bobby Kotick mentioned that Nintendo had briefed him on the device last year and its performance profile was in line with last-gen console hardware. Well, that may well be the case, but one could equally say that the Switch had similar horsepower on the GPU side to the Wii U or Xbox 360, but it punched well above that weight. So how? Through more modern GPU and more memory for starters, I'd venture to suggest. And I suspect that Switch 2 will be much the same, if not more so thanks to things like machine learning acceleration, raid facing capabilities, and much faster storage. So what should we really hope for from the hardware then? I mean, Bobby Kotick's basically talking about PS4 class performance, right? But meanwhile, we're hearing talk of the Matrix Awakens on Unreal Engine 5 running on it. And that's something that a PlayStation 4 or even a PS4 Pro could never hope to do. Well, here's where we do some extensive practical work. There's no real equivalent counterpart for the capabilities of the A78C CPU cluster in the PC space, but when it comes to the GPU, we can get kind of close. So this is the Dell Vostro 5630, and it comes equipped with the following specs. Core i7, 1360p, a 16 inch 1920 by 1200 LCD, 16 gigs of 4800 MHz LPDDR5, a 512 gig SSD and an RTX 2050. It's that last component we're looking at more closely here. Let's stack up its specifications 
against what we've learned about the T239 in a potential Switch 2. First of all, despite its designation as an RTX 20 series part, it's actually the exact same silicon as the Ampere-based RTX 3050 and 3050 Ti. It's a GA107 processor. We can't match the 1536 CUDA cores of the T239, but 2048 CUDA cores is the lowest we can get on an Ampere gaming GPU. So why not simply get a 3050 laptop then? Well, think of the 2050 as a lobotomized 3050. Lower power budget, lower clocks, and crucially, a 64-bit memory interface. At 96 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, it operates with a considerable bottleneck versus the 3050, but it also gives us ballpark equivalents with the bandwidth a potential Switch 2 could deliver. One sticking point though, the 2050 only ships with 4 gigs of RAM. I'd expect to see 8 gigs or even 12 gigs of total system memory in Switch 2. Even so, we're going to take the RTX 2050 and we're going to massively downclock it and see what it can do. The minimum clocks I could get from the 2050 were 750 megahertz. So if this is ballpark switch to performance, it's likely closer to a docked configuration when you factor in that it has those extra CUDA cores. And yeah, let's not forget that although we're targeting pretty meager specs here, the architecture can still handle hardware accelerated ray tracing. It should at least be able to run DLSS, so we'll be looking at those workloads too. Now before we go on, let's be totally clear here. This is the closest approximation we can get for the T239 GPU. But more accurately, what you're going to be seeing is an ultra low spec Ampere GPU running at meager clock speeds, starved of memory bandwidth. And this is only going to give us a ballpark idea of what a mobile Ampere chip can deliver. But even so, the results are intriguing. Uh, first of all, let's get the disappointment out of the way. You can't get the Matrix Awakens PC demo running on it. We literally built a custom build in an attempt to do so using DLSS. However, owing to the four gigs of frame buffer memory with the 2050, we're at least 1.6 gigabytes short of being able to contain the necessary assets. But we will be taking a look at Fortnite a bit later which does seem to fit within the available memory once texture quality is dialed back to the minimum. For now, let's kick off by taking a look at Death Stranding, a game using Gorilla's Decima engine, and which also happens to have a pretty performant PC port. This is gameplay captured directly from the RTX 2050, with the game capped at 30 frames per second, and to be clear, it's running at default quality settings, so basically on par with PlayStation 4. We're actually using 1440p output resolution though in DLSS performance mode. The overall impression is rather good I'd say, but to get some idea on scalability, let's try a benchmark. So this is the Death Stranding introduction, which is typically much heavier on the GPU than most of the gameplay. Well, to be more specific, <laughs> the intro actually starts off as a 4K60 video sequence before transitioning into real-time graphics, but obviously we're just looking at the real-time portion of this sequence. At 1080p native, it averages out at 34.9 FPS, which does support the last-gen power narrative. At 720p, frame rate rises to 52.5 FPS. I've also run this bench at DLSS quality mode too. 67% of native resolution, 34.9 FPS average increases to 44.7 FPS. At 720p with DLSS, perhaps what we're going to be seeing in handheld mode on Switch 2, frame rate does increase, but the performance differential is difficult to accurately measure because the sequence is actually capped at 60 FPS. Still, looking at gameplay, 1440p in DLSS performance mode is viable on this little Ampere-based GPU. And while much of the gameplay played out locked at 30 frames per second, there were some dips beneath. In this confrontation with the BTs, the heavy post-processing seemed to be too much for the GPU to cope with. Still, I'd say that this is a promising start. So let's crack on with our next test. And I'm not going to be making life any easier for the 2050. Cyberpunk 2077 is a demanding title that brought last-gen consoles to their knees. So here I'm benching on the medium preset, then in various flavors of DLSS at 1080p. Resolutions beyond that, just too much. 
Again, to disrupt the Switch 4K narrative perhaps, remember we're dealing with low spec hardware as compared to say current gen consoles and PC. There's every possibility that 1080p may well be the best we'll get in a world where Xbox Series S can routinely upscale from below that. Interesting thing here is that 1080p DLSS performance mode upscaling from 540p is only 7.5% faster than native 720p. DLSS balance mode has 95% of the native 720p performance, dropping to 84% at DLSS quality mode. So again, DLSS quality mode, which is native 720p, drains about 16% of performance in order to upscale to 1080p. Even so, DLSS quality mode averages out at 33 frames per second, while all other readings go higher. So for gameplay, initially I thought I'd be ultra optimistic and essentially dialed in the console equivalent performance mode settings into the PC version of Cyberpunk and to try it out on the hobbled RTX 2050, targeting 30 FPS instead of 60, but using DLSS balance mode at 1080p resolution. Initially, things seemed to be going well as we stepped out V's apartment into Night City. However, it quickly became clear that more taxing effects work was having an impact on performance, as you can see here as we sit down for a snack with Jackie Wells. Traversal, yeah, that's always challenging in Cyberpunk 2077. And yes, that didn't hold up particularly well either. Still, I mean, it's playable with better performance than a lot of Switch games I've played. And of course, we are aiming high with PS5 equivalent settings. Dropping back to DLSS performance mode improved matters and while there were still some frame rate dips beneath the 30 FPS target, we were closing in on locking to our preferred performance level, bearing in mind the constraints of the hardware. However, in our next stress test, the notorious Cherry Blossom Marketplace, once again we found the limits of our resource-constrained mobile GPU. I've got to say though that most of the game seemed to play out reasonably well. It's just individual points within the marketplace that cause problems. You know, even kicking off a gunfight didn't seem to make matters that much worse, when usually pitched combat within this area can have profound performance issues. I also tried flat medium settings in DLSS balance mode with low distant shadow resolution and ambient occlusion and medium volumetric resolution. I also ramped up the crowd density to high because, well, for me it's a big part of the cyberpunk experience. But again, perhaps a bit too optimistic. And yeah, the market was still a problem. But again, much of the content I played through ran without issue. And you know, gotta say, it looks pretty great. So there's a big discussion to have about DLSS and image quality in general. So in the PC space, it's generally considered that it's quote unquote okay to run the upscaler at performance mode at 4K, balanced mode at 1440p and quality mode at 1080p, though obviously if you have the horsepower to use higher quality presets to get the performance you want, well go for it. But that's PC gaming. Console gaming in the living room is different I'd say. You're sat much further away from the screen and image quality expectations from this level of hardware are just generally different anyway. After all, we've seen some remarkably low resolutions already this generation, even from PS5 and Xbox Series X. So I actually think for a mobile chipset attached to a living room display, DLSS at 1080p can look perfectly reasonable, whether it's quality, balanced, or in many scenarios, even the performance mode. It will certainly look better than most of the demanding Switch 1 games we've seen in docked play, blown up onto that 4K living room screen. I'd say that our compromised RTX 2050 is producing some impressive results when you factor in that this is the absolute weakest Ampere class GPU on the laptop market. And when the default 1350 MHz boost clock I experience with it is pegged back to a mere 750 MHz. And I would fully expect to see similar limitations with actual Switch 2 hardware in terms of compute power. And remember, it will have a constrained power budget as well. And of course, the already constricted memory bandwidth will have to service the CPU as well as the GPU. Still, Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p achieved with DLSS. Now maybe this isn't the Switch 4K narrative many are hoping for. Expectation management is always key when assessing mobile hardware, especially Nintendo hardware. Next test, one of my favourites, A Plague Tale Requiem, which again is a demanding game, which seems especially challenging in terms of memory bandwidth, which is at a premium with the RTX 2050 here, and impacts pretty much any handheld device you care to mention. 
I'm using the load settings here, but with a tweak or two. The load preset itself turns off features like ambient occlusion and contact shadows. Um, yeah, I'm not particularly keen on that, so I turned them back on on their own low settings. DLSS balance mode here, as even on a living room display, I noticed that performance mode could show artifacting on high motion. Balance mode just looks a lot better. Now look, the market scene here actually plays out quite beautifully, locked to 30 frames per second. And in common with many titles targeting current gen systems, low settings can look absolutely fine. And even the classic Rat Deluge set piece plays out smoothly, which is quite surprising, bearing in mind the lengths that developer Asobo Studio went to in its console performance mode, where we saw that Rat animations ran at half rate. However, Visuals and effects typically associated with heavy consumption of memory bandwidth cause issues. In fact, right from the beginning, the first area of the game can drop frames even if we pair back the resolution from 1080p DLSS balance mode to 900p DLSS balance mode. It's at this point that we should remember that Switch games typically receive some tweaks to content in order to smooth out performance, or we get stuff like dynamic resolution scaling added. It's called optimizing for the strengths and the weaknesses of a specific platform. And that's a magic ingredient that none of our testing here is gonna be able to highlight, right? I mean, we're using the PC versions of the game. Next up, let's take a look at another one of my favorites, Remedies Control, a game I've chosen because it tends to run well on mobile devices. It's low settings, actually very good looking, and well, it's time to look at how ray tracing presents on an ultra-constrained piece of NVIDIA graphics hardware. Um, so look, running at 30 FPS here, but Control doesn't have an in-game 30 FPS cap, but that's okay, because Chaldean's Special K can do the job quite nicely. PS5 and Series X effectively run the game at 1440p resolution on low settings or thereabouts with medium RT. That's the setup I'm mirroring here at 1080p DLSS balance mode. So yeah, Medium RT essentially gives us ray traced reflections and transparency reflections, just like the console versions. The difference being that the console implementation of those reflections used checkerboarding to increase performance. That's not an option available to me here on the PC version. Still, as you can see, with DLSS balance mode reconstructing to 1080p, we can get a good looking rendition of control. We get the beautiful RT reflections, and for the most part, gameplay did play out at 30 frames per second in my testing. It is a pretty varied game though, and in certain sections, we do drop beneath the target performance level. The console versions also had a 60 FPS performance mode, which played out pretty flawlessly, but I found that this just wasn't possible on the RTX 2050. Mostly we're in 50 to 60 frames per second territory, though we can go lower. I even tested here on DLSS performance mode, and still couldn't get a lock to 60. It's a bit of a disappointment, but there we are. Okay, so the final game I took a look at was Fortnite, Unreal Engine 5, Lumen, Nanite, Virtual Shadow Maps, the entire UE5 feature set on display here. And unlike the console versions, we do actually have access to hardware accelerated ray tracing in the PC version. And yes, it does run on the RTX 2050 laptop. These are the baseline settings I used, a mixture of high, medium and low, but with the key UE5 features in place. I've got screen space reflections configured here, but I also tested hardware RT reflections, of course. To get like-for-like -like results, or as close to them as possible at least, I used Fortnite's replay system, testing across a sample of 14 minutes of gameplay. Pretty sure I'm not memory limited here, as I am using the lowest quality textures, but even so, there are occasionally egregious stutters that seem to apply to all of the various runs I carried out, albeit in different places. This isn't shader compilation stutter, by the way. I'm using the benchmark template here, so you're only seeing one representation in the background. The visuals there are showing DLSS performance mode with full hardware accelerated ray tracing GI and reflections in play. Truth is, as you can see from the results, there's not exactly much to tell the various readings apart as we compare native 720p with both forms of RT to DLSS performance mode, again, with both software and hardware RT runs. At native 720p, there's just a 4% delta between the two RT variants, dropping to 3% with DLSS performance mode at a reconstructed 1080p. 
However, when frame rates are this low, the real world data is just 1 to 1.5 frames per second. For the record, Software RT with DLSS performance mode is the winner in performance terms, but between the best and the worst results here, there's just a 9.5% difference, and in FPS terms, that's just an average 2.82 frames per second. I actually benchmarked this content across 17 different runs in total, but never found a permutation that would lock to 30 frames per second. Fortnite may be using high-end UE5 features, but it's positively optimal, much faster compared to, say, Immortals of Avium, another Unreal Engine 5 game that pushes the envelope. My guess is that the Matrix Awakens demo for Switch 2, based on target hardware, probably is real, but Epic must be doing a lot of work in making Unreal Engine 5's key features run well on the Nintendo hardware. That being the case, just running PC code on a low power Ampere GPU isn't likely to be that revealing. Still, it does run. You can use hardware RT. DLSS is useful. It does work. But yeah, next topic, DLSS. I've been using it a lot in these tests, but there's every chance that how it presents in the actual Switch 2 will be quite different to its impact in these tests. Remember all the talk about Switch 4K and how DLSS is used to get to Ultra HD resolutions? Well, we're in danger of moving into wish fulfillment territory here, but maybe there is some secret source, or not so secret source. But the point is that for DLSS to be truly transformative, I'm not sure the tensor cores in a mobile orientated Ampere GPU are going to cut it. Something that Alex pointed out in a video he made years ago, it's being borne out here. So let's go back to Death Stranding and take a look at another run of benchmarks I did, where everything you're seeing here is actually based on native 720p rendering. We have a native 720p benchmark, then we have various DLSS upscaling factors to boost to higher output pixel counts. This is to emphasize that DLSS is not a free lunch. Its computational cost on the GPU increases according to output resolution, even though the input resolution is always the same, 720p. We lose 15% of performance in DLSS quality mode, so we're reconstructing here to 1080p from that 720p base. We lose 29% of performance moving to 1440p in DLSS performance mode. Again, a native 720p at the core of it all before upscaling takes place. And finally, wow, 49% of performance is lost in upscaling 720p to 4K DLSS ultra performance mode. Using these figures, we can work out a per frame millisecond cost, uh, remembering that frame time at 30 FPS is 33.3 milliseconds, and at 60 FPS it's 16.7 milliseconds. Remember those figures. So going from 720p to 1080p DLSS quality mode costs us 3.35 milliseconds per frame, which is equitable, I'd say, and cheaper than rendering natively at 1080p. At 1440p, the cost of DLSS upscaling is 7.7 .7 milliseconds. Things are starting to get serious now, but likely still cheaper than native rendering. At 4K though, the 18.3 millisecond cost compared to native 720p is crazy high. It rules out DLSS for 4K upscaling altogether. And for 30fps gaming, it's 55% of total render time available. It's just not viable, which puts the whole Switch 4K narrative into doubt, right? I mean, those reports of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild running at 4K 60 via DLSS. If DLSS takes over 16.7 milliseconds to upscale to 4K, it's literally impossible to get 4K 60 on any content. But let's go back to the big fat T234 processor on which the Switch 2's T239 is derived. Built for the automotive industry, it needs machine learning performance beyond what the GPU alone can offer, so it's augmented with a deep learning accelerator that can work in tandem with the tensor cores to increase performance. If we're talking about Switch 2 producing 4K DLSS in any form, I can't really see any other way that this would work unless that deep learning accelerator is in there and it would be transformative for DLSS upscaling. It would make 4K output viable, possibly. But yeah, interesting stuff, right? Still lots we don't know, and that's basically where I'm up to right now with Switch 2. It's technological makeup, and the kind of ballpark performance that an ultra-paired-back Ampere GPU can deliver. 
There is still controversy though and unresolved questions. The T239 chip looks to be a Samsung 8 nanometer processor, so it's going to be big. It may not be particularly power efficient. Some believe it's not really viable for a handheld. On that score, we'll just need to wait and see, but based on everything I've put together for this video, there's promise here for sure. But really, the magic is going to be coming from the developers themselves. Take a look back to when Doom 2016 first appeared on Switch. Didn't even believe it could be possible. And that trend continued with ports like The Witcher 3. What about the Crisis Trilogy remasters? They were pretty amazing. Or the amazing ports produced by Rebellion North, like the Sniper Elite and Zombie Army games. These titles defied the technological limits of the Tegra X1. And regardless of the T239 specs and all the tests I've done today, I expect to see the same magic the next time around on the next generation Nintendo machine. So that's the end of the video. And if you enjoyed it, you know what I tend to say at this point, which is that liking, subscribing and sharing is obviously helpful. Ringing the bell for notionally instant notifications, possibly that too. But really, it's all about the DF supporter program where with help from supporters like Eric Harrison and the ever helpful Fiddler underscore 2K, I was able to more fully flesh out this content. The community we've built, it's pretty amazing. And yeah, of course, DF Supporter Program also gives you early access opportunities, DF Direct weekly privileges, bonus videos and high quality video downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me on this one. So thanks for making it all the way to the end of this video, assuming that you did. And of course, as ever, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.